So um, yeah, it's really wonderful that I've got this opportunity to connect with you online in this format and give you an update um, on our Avon Valley project. Now, incredibly, we um, celebrated our 10 year anniversary last year. Um, and that is really something in itself to celebrate. Conservation advisory based projects, as this one is, usually have a very short shelf life due to funding. So, for instance, we had the wonderful Greater Horseshoe Bat project that was funded by Nat uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, which was a five year project. Saving Devon Treescapes, which is active at the moment, has five years worth of funding. And we've been really lucky with um, the Avon Valley project that our funding is more open ended and suddenly we've arrived at 10 years and um, we've arrived at that at that point where our work is more relevant and more needed than ever. So I work as a land management advisory officer working with farmers, landowners and growers. Um, and I've had the absolute pleasure of working on the Avon Valley project for the past 10 years, so from its inception to date. So I just activate the slides, which I hope you can all see. So um, we've published a really lovely brochure that gives a lot of detail about, about the project and also headlines some of our achievements. Um, that is available online via our website if you want to have a look at it or download it, or we even have some um, paper, lovely paper copies as well. If you want to have one, just let us know. Anyway, we're a landscape scale project from source to sea. I need to start with some thanks because my post is core funded by Devon Wildlife Trust. And that means if you're a member of the trust, your uh, contributions go towards my role. So thank you for that. Um, we've been fortunate as well in having one main co-funder, the South Devon Nature Trust. They were a private charitable trust um, who were interested in sponsoring um, this work. Um, and rather than just donate money to DWT, um, they subcontracted, they paid for a fellow advisor. So for the past eight years, I worked alongside um, two guys who I will be mentioning in a very short period of time, who were funded by South Devon Nature Trust, and that made the world of difference. Again, this project is different from a little bit different from our other advisory based projects in as much as we set our stall out and we're open to working with all kinds of landowners. So that means not just farmers. So anyone who owns land, um, we want to connect with you. So we're working with people who've got half an acre, one acre, 25 acres, 100 acres and larger estates. And our premise is that everybody has got a bit of the jigsaw, everybody has got a contribution to make. Our main focus when we started 10 years ago was to create new wildlife corridors and to ensure that those corridors that did exist already within the valley were as robust as they could be. But what we've ended up delivering and achieving is habitat change. So the creation of new habitat, new woodlands, new hedgerows, wildflower meadows, creating a much, um, a much more varied and a much more diverse landscape and um, that's better for nature all around. And this project is all about relationships. Um, in the past, our projects of, uh, where we're working with farmers who of course are making, earning a living from their land, so their priorities are quite different from other people. Um, We've used agri-environment schemes as a really effective tool um, to offer some financial incentives in return for producing um, wildlife habitat. We haven't used that scheme as, as, a, as a main tool 
with this work. A lot of the sites would be too small, they wouldn't be suitable. So a lot of this work is based on goodwill. We provide free of charge advice and practical support, and we monitor as well. And it's a very much based on collaboration and partnerships. And it's come to mean a lot about a lot to people, and it means a lot to us. Um, in any birthday, um, there's somebody receiving the um, congratulations and all that benevolent loveliness. And um, it's been my honor as DWT's focal point and project officer to receive those compliments. Um, but it's very much a team effort. And I just wanted to mention my two former colleagues who have done so much to help build this project. So to start with, on the, on the right hand side, uh, there's a chap called Ed Parferis, who helped kick things off. Ed now works with DWT in conservation advocacy. Um, so he's still around in the trust. Um, but Ed taught me, I guess, how to broaden and expand my vision for nature conservation in the area. And then on the left uh, is a chap called Craig Dunton, who I worked alongside with for six years. Craig brought a huge amount of um, a range of skills uh, to the project. He's a really good naturalist. He led on dormouse monitoring and bat monitoring. Um, he also worked on the Grey Long Ear Bat Project with the Bat Conservation Trust um, and has now got a lecturing role at Bicton College. So thanks to those two um, for helping the project along. And in the bottom left hand corner, um, alongside Craig and Izzy and Sparky, the two collie dogs, is Jackie Gage, who um, left DWT in the autumn um, after, after a good number of years at the Trust. And Jackie was a former Nature Reserve officer looking after Andrews Wood, Nature Reserve, South Efford Marsh and Ladies Wood that are in the Aden Valley. And Jackie was instrumental in um, helping us um, do practical works on private sites by using our Nature Reserve volunteer team. So thanks to you, Jackie, wherever you are. And in the middle, also my Nature Reserve colleagues, Andy Baker, who's left the trust, Andrew Warren, Simon Tommaso in North Devon, Simon Berry, and all those people behind the scenes um, that helped make the Avon Valley project a success. So thanks to them. And also thanks to our volunteers. And this is um, our group who were encouraged to, yay, we've reached the 10 years. Um, they were raking, um, raking off grass in uh in on a damp day in november um to prepare it for for wildflower seed so a big thank you so moving on to landowners i've already said we offer free of charge advice to the landowning community of the avon valley and we started off um as i said wanting to join things together. So wanting to reduce habitat fragmentation and create corridor, corridors like, create, like planting new hedgerows between otherwise too isolated pockets of woodland. And we started with a loose vision. Um, and at the time we met somebody else who had a vision. We met, um, Natasha and Barney Green, who run Heron Valley Soft Drinks. And um, they bought a new orchard, um, about 10 acres on the outskirts of Lodiswell. The picture on the right is, um, is us broadcasting in yellow rattleseed to try and enhance the grassland just after the new trees had been planted. And it was Tasha's intention to build a cafe and a new processing plant in the corner of that field. And, and she said, when, when I've built it, you can come and have a, an event here. 
we want to be involved, run, run your event. And it took seven years for that to come to fruition. But last year, we did have our event there. And this is Tasha. Um, in November, we were able to um, get together uh, our, land our group of landowners. Um, we had an audience of about 40 people, so as many as we could in these, uh, in these times of COVID. Um, and we had delicious cake and um, guest speakers. Rebecca Hosking, who's a local landowner um, uh, in Modbury, which Rebecca's just sitting uh, next to me there on the front row, just see the back of our heads. Um, and this is Tash setting the scene. And she also was able to um, bring in Kate Humble, who she met also several years ago when she was building that, uh, that new that their new premises, as Kate was um, making a TV program, Back to the Land, and Tasha and Barney and their Heron Valley um, enterprise was part of that program. And we were really honored to be, to be able to have Kate at that, um, at that evening. And projects like this give real cause for optimism was just one of the compliments that she that she paid she, that she paid the project so i think it's important in these times to celebrate um to celebrate achievements however small um and to celebrate the small things the small steps i want to give you a bit of context about where we are um we are the Avon Valley is one of um, five rivers that rises in southern on southern Dartmoor. Um, it flows 25 miles to its source at Bigbury at Bantham Beach. Um, and most of it lies within an area of outstanding natural beauty. And the reason that South Devon has got that designation is probably due to those river valleys. You can see we've got the Tamar, we've got the um, Yelm, we've got the Erm, we've got the Avon, Kingsbridge and Salcombe Estuary, we've got the Dart, and then a bit further round Torbay, we've got the Teen. Um, it creates an extremely special environment. Our project area covers 17,000 hectares from source to sea. Um, we're bounded by, to the east, the A381, uh, Totnes to Kingsbridge Road, if you're more familiar with that. And then to the east, um, we've just extended our boundary to include the, Lug, the Ludd Brook. Um, but our aim has been to be from source to sea. I like to think of the river as the main trunk of a beautiful, think of a beautiful veteran oak tree with these 17 branches, which are the subcatchments, the tributaries. Each has got its own valley systems, which create a really unique and very special environment, which enables um, to raise some wonderful species to have their roosting and nesting sites there. But I'm going to start in the soup on the moor. Um, this is me, uh, at, as close to the source as I could be at Riders Hill, on a very threatened and special habitat, remnants of, uh, of, of blanket bog up on the moor. And this is what the land looks like above, above the reservoir wild, boggy, inhospitable, still an area that, uh, that belongs to itself, with some incredible bird life on Dartmoor. The cuckoo, that, that is a really wonderful uh, photo by a chap called John Deakins. Cuckoos which have declined 70% um, in recent years, still have their migratory corridors through the Avon. Skylarks, which are both on the moor, and also you can hear them down at the coast, down at Bantham. 
snipe in the bottom right hand corner again a bird of the moor um, and also hanging on in some wetter grasslands in the Avon Valley can probably be found at Andrews Wood um, and on South Efford Marsh Nature Reserve. And for good measure, I threw in a picture of the ring goosel, which um, is a bird that I've not seen yet, um, but um, you can see them at Cadover Bridge up by Yelverton on the moor uh, as well. Avon Dam. Another unique feature of this uh, of this beautiful river, built in 1957, um, supplies uh, the reservoir supplies most of our drinking water in the South Hams, if not all of it. So every time you turn on your tap in South Devon, you're connecting with the with the Avon. And from source to sea, the Avon's got some fantastic habitats, ancient woodlands floodplain meadows, orchards, the steep valley systems that I've referred to knitted together with hedgerows interspersed with small copses. And then we get down to the, the intertidal areas of the estuary. This is one of just a handful of sites around our coast that is a designated marine conservation zone for its um, salt marsh, its mud flats and its sandbanks that supports some rare and special aquatic marine life. And we've even got an island at the end of it, Burr Island. This is an aerial shot, but it's also a landscape that's under pressure, um, not just from development that uh, is going on apace all over the county, but it's quite intensively farmed. Um, every bit of the South Hams that can be farmed and can be ploughed has been and it's farmed South Devon and the Avon is no exception where we can see here there's farming right to the edge. The Avon is home to some incredibly rare and special species. Greater horseshoe bats have a main maternity roost in the centre of the valley. Heath lobelia, I mentioned our Andrews Wood Nature Reserve. Heath lobelia only occurs on three sites in the UK and the populations at, uh, at Andrews Wood um, are the largest in the country. So incredibly rare. Grey long-eared bat, um, the UK's most endangered bat. Again, that's a, that's a creature that has its maternity roosts in the Avon Valley. Barn owls and water voles that we believe to be extinct in the county 20 years ago. 10 years ago, a chap called Derek Gow released some animals down at South Milton Lay. And we were able to confirm last year that, um, that a few animals had mated and bred and those populations are, are, have established and are thriving. And we'd even had um, reports of sightings further up in the valley which we investigated as well. So we're hopeful that their territory um, and their range can spread. But it's, if, that's all, if it's all so special, wonderful habitats from blanket bog to marine conservation zone, rare aquatic species, et cetera, et cetera, why are we here? Well, we're here because the terrifying truth is that the species that those, um, rarer species rely on, the common things, they too are in decline. Um, the insects, the roosting sites, the nesting sites, their food webs are all in danger of collapse. And so we have a collective responsibility to put nature back, to make space for nature. The UK State of Nature report in 2019 that was published, 41% um, of species in decline, 15% threatened with extinction. And the UK, one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Um, it's really quite staggering when so much of our countryside aesthetically looks so beautiful. Is it really nothing more than a shell? We have to do something um, to address this. And um, with the Avon Valley project, we've got a little bit ahead of the game. 
Devon Wildlife Trust for as long as I've been with them and I've had the pleasure of uh, being fortunate to be employed for the past 20 years doing this kind of work. So for over 25 years, we firmly believe that the way that you get uh, that we can get change in the wider countryside is through connecting with people. It's people that make a difference for wildlife and by connecting with our landowning community in its widest sense, um, we're giving our wildlife the best chance we can. So this over the course that course of 10 years, uh, we've connected with over 210 separate land holdings. So that's over 400 individual landowners that are learning about the importance of wildlife corridors, the importance of um, putting the habitat back and why we're concerned about it and why it really matters that we, we should all do whatever we can. All that work, all, that, all those visits take uh, time. We've made over 1,800 of those, 1,800 encounters, enabling, enthusing, and learning. This is very much a shared experience. And why do we need to reconnect? Why is it important? So habitat, habitat uh, fragmentation, um, is something that 10, 10 years ago, people weren't very familiar with the terms and what that meant. This isn't in, in the Avon patch. Uh, this isn't in South Devon, it's in North Devon. But basically it gives you an idea, the area in the foreground surrounded by uh, bushy hedgerows, linking to woodlands on the left-hand side. But the quality of the habitat surrounding it um, you know, there's tightly flailed hedges, or there might even be wire fences. We want to work in between those, uh, in between the gaps, in between the, the area in the foreground and the other beige looking site just on the, um, to the north of your picture, uh, the top section of your picture. We want to make reinforce those corridors so that wildlife have got more room um, to manoeuvre. This is in uh, South Devon, this is in the Avon, on the edge of the Avon catchment and more in the Urm. This is where we want to focus some of our work in the next um, 12 months. Um, this is a county wildlife site, um, wonderful wet grassland. Um, managed organically, um, flower rich meadows, um, its wildlife is sadly declining. Uh, and you can see why, because to the south of it, it's surrounded by um, cultivated land, um, no field margins, um, very poor tightly flailed hedgerows, few hedgerows, few hedgerow trees. And so it's easy to see how um, places like this become islands. And we want to get out of that mentality. We want to build a landscape that is actually more cohesive, more joined up. And this is what drives us on. And no, no, no one species defines um, habitat symbolizes habitat connectivity more than the dormouse. And Craig initiated a dormouse monitoring program. Andrews Wood Nature Reserve, for those of you who might know, has one of our largest and strongest uh, dormouse populations in the Southwest. But we knew very little about dormice, um, about dormouse, dormouse in the rest of the area. So Craig ran a series of nest box building um, workshops, nut hunts and farm walks um, and monitored um, eight new sites. Uh, he trained up, uh, most importantly, um, new, new surveyors, so people who got their dormouse handling license through Natural England. And they can, and there's now, so there's now five new people who have got a license who are out there able to do monitor, monitoring. Um, and we doubled the record of, of, uh, 
of Dormouse Records for the catchment. Dormice need hedges to move around, as I've said several times. Um, and so the creation of new corridors with the help of landowners, um, because it's landowners who are doing this, doing this work. So um, in the picture is a um, 475 metres of new hedge that was planted about three years ago. Um, both landowners either side uh, of that new hedge um, decided that would be a fantastic thing to do. Um, and we encouraged one set of landowners to go for a, a grant scheme. Uh, the Woodland Trust offer a, um, grants, 75% grants to plant new hedgerows under their More Hedges scheme. So the landowner uh, got a grant from the Woodland Trust. Um, they fenced, they, they, the landowner paid for fencing and we provided volunteer help to actually get the trees in the ground. We've also helped uh, landowners create new woodlands by planting the trees with our volunteer support and shelter belt planting. And um, that's just the um, habitat creation that we know about or we've been involved in. Um, our landowners are doing so much more. On another monitoring initiative, we work with the anglers, uh, who are the eyes on the river. Um, we support them with their river fly monitoring, monitoring mayflies, stoneflies, caddis flies, because obviously if the flies are there, that's good for the fish. Um, they monitor four sites um, between March and September each year. They probably need some new volunteers to, um, to help out with this activity. So if any of, any of you are out there who would like to get involved, please contact me and I can pass your name on to um, John Roberts, the chair of the Angling Association that does this work for us. It also alerts us to um, if there are any pollution episodes within the river, um, we have a threshold score. So we're expecting to see a certain percentage of invertebrates. And if that goes down, um, or if there are any, if there's anything untoward on the river, then um, the Environment Agency can be notified of that really quickly. People power, that's what we've relied on. Uh, and I'm going to give a mention to these two um, incredible people in the forefront of this picture. On the right, a chap called Nick Toms, who farms at Westlake, who um, generously allowed us to harvest wildflower seed from his meadows for five consecutive years. Um, I'm going to give you a bit more information on our wildflower making uh, shortly. Um, but basically we have created this network of new donor sites. So creating new wildflower meadows that can be, the seed can be harvested to help other wildflower meadows get going. Um, Nick donated the seed to us and we donate it to other meadow makers. And on the left, Mary Clark. Now Mary has uh, 50 acres of valley grassland at Woodley. Um, and she purchased the land in the late nine in 1999, actually, because um, it was inarable land and uh, with no hedgerows. And the winter of 1999 and 2000 was extremely wet. I think it rained for about six months. And um, there's a central corridor, uh, a channel that separates the valley. Um, and water and soil and silt and shale ended up in her garden. So as it all came downstream and she was also flooded by the river. Um, so she had it uh, pretty bad both ways. So she it was in the fortunate position of being able to buy the valley. And since 2012, 2013, we've been working with Mary to change the management on the site. Shortly after she bought the land, she put the hedgerows back um, 
with the Countryside Stewardship Grant. Uh, and then it was grazed very well, I have to say. Uh, it was in within a farming system, but Mary wanted to do something much more diverse and to create um, a nature reserve, basically. And Mary has bequeathed the land to DWT, and that's what the land is doing. It's becoming more species rich. It's an example of a site that's wilding in the softest sense. Um, this was the land in 2013, and Mary was paying for a series of ponds to be put in. In May 2013, this was what the grassland looked like. So um, the yellow flower heads of dandelions um, did have a number of grasses, uh, some meadow foxtail in there, um, some bent, a bit of sweet vernal grass, but um, some fields were just rye grass and clover dominated, not very interesting at all. Several years later, and this is the same site, um, the changes are subtle but positive. Um, we're seeing the hedgerows starting to bush out. The pond network that Mary put in in that central channel has established and is developing. Uh, we've converted 15 acres, so three fields, to hay meadow. Um, by using yellow rattle as a tool. Um, and this is one of those fields in July, 2019. Mary built a barn, uh, maybe 2016, 17, and put up a barn owl box and barn owls are breeding there, which is absolutely fantastic to see. So the field that we're looking at in the foreground um, that is just a sea of yellow rattle, eye bright, knapweed, southern marsh orchids, um, buzzing with insects in the summer. Um, these are some of the species that we've observed over time at Mary's. Small copper butterflies, an increase in bumblebees, mother shipton moths, brown hair use it as a lying up area glowworms further down in the valley and where we planted uh, planted trees to create shelter belts along the um, sides of the hedgerows, um, we found harvest mouse nests. All this has taken time, but it shows that given a chance and given changes in management, nature can recover. Uh, this is an example of a habitat change as well. Apologies for the um, poor quality of this photo, um, but we're looking at black down rings up on the, up on the ridge. Uh, and this is an area of land in Loddiswell Parish where we met with the landowners. The sites were being conventionally grazed, cut for hay in mid-May, uh, in mid-June, as most of our fields are. And he wanted to do something a bit more dynamic with his land. So he left it and he took off the grazing stock and he's not cut it for hay for two or three years. And what we've got is this development of this coarse or rough grassland habitat, which is so vital for predatory birds like barn owls, like uh, kestrels, because they feed on the small mammals that will burrow into the tussocks. Um, and these places are vital for our insects as well, just as vital as the flower rich habitat that we are uh, creating. So they need these rough, unattractive, perhaps areas to lay their eggs, to shelter, to overwinter, uh, to breed. These are the sex and death and rock and roll areas for the insect world. So when you're creating flower rich areas, yes, you're doing something fantastic for pollinating insects, but if you can leave a rough patch, however small, uh, whether it's in your garden, uh, just leave a, an area uncut, um, then do so because that has value too. 
what we found, uh, we we believe that um, good wildflower meadows were in very were very few and far between in the Avon Valley, but where we find them are hanging on on uh, the valley slopes. So what we're looking at here is there's a the the field on the on the valley slope that you can see with the uh, the little white dots which are sheep grazing. Um, when we met the landowner, that was being strip grazed very early in the spring by by cows. And when I went to do a survey, I looked what was under my Wellington boots and I could just see the rose, rosettes and basil leaves of so many flowers. You don't really have to know what things are. You just know whether you're looking at more grasses or more flowers. Um, and I talked to the landowner about this and we negotiated for one season a change of management and that change of management involved him just grazing a little bit later. So what we asked the landowner to do was to not graze in early April, but actually could he leave it until mid-May and he was totally amazed at, uh, at the results because what started to come up was a field that supports um, agrimony, St. John's wort, um, black knapweed, cat's ears, vetches. Uh, and of course, all those flowers um, have a very long um, flowering period. Um, most of our meadows in South Devon, their flowering is over by the end of June. And the rarer, the rarer meadows to, 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 to come across are those which have got the later flowering species. So this was a bit of a, of a, of a, of a treasure. So we were able to raise awareness, show the landowner what a, what a jewel in the crown he got. Um, we surveyed it and um, it was designated a county wildlife site. And through that, the landowner was able to access a higher level of funding through countryside stewardship scheme. Now those steep slopes can scrub up. This isn't the same site, um, but this is uh, this is uh, yeah, it's incredible, really, how high gorse can grow um, when it's just left to its own devices. So we certainly need more scrub and successional uh, habitat in our, in our landscapes. Um, scrub is at its most value for wildlife in its young and juvenile bushy stages when it provides some cover for birds and reptiles. Um, it's still producing a source of nectar in its more mature stage, um, but also it, it casts a lot of shade and it can suppress the finer leaf wildflowers from coming through. So where we've got sites like this um, that need a little bit of work to enhance them, we're able to use our volunteers to um, get in there to take the gorse down and start creating more of a mosaic and more opportunity for habitat diversity. Here are our volunteers as well, planting new hedgerows, usually on, on very wet, inclement days when you really just wouldn't go out at all, um, and helping with meadow making. Um, on the right hand side, uh, where sites don't have access to stock, maybe they're not stock proof. Um, we can help with that as well, because we have some temporary fencing and a water bowser. I'll also work with conservation graziers, cows in clover to um, so that grazing animals can do the job of getting uh, enhancing meadows um, and reduce the um, reduce the need for labor. Um, but also um, our volunteers helping with green hay. So down in the bottom right hand corner last year we used um, some of you might be familiar with Long Marsh in Totnes. Uh, it's a public open space alongside the River Dart that also has some really lovely grassland. And in conjunction with South Hams District Council and um, a community and uh, 
community interest company park life um, we were able to cut an area bag it up and transfer it the same day so that the seed dropped on a site that we're trying to enhance and so on to our meadow making we have uh created we're now we've now got 40 hectares or 100 acres of new flower rich habitat meadows in transition i like to call them um that wasn't there when we started the project um and i've already explained that our colleagues do the uh in the nature reserve team do the practical side of that um we've been doing this work devon wildlife trust for a really long time so um uh yes very um unusually i've just been told i've only got five minutes so i'll that's thrown me a little bit so i will probably skip through this um and just tell you that yes our pro our colleagues in north devon have been doing this work for a very long time on a much bigger scale um but we have got incredible, incredibly satisfying results. So people donate, farmers donate us the seed, we use yellow rattle rich meadows, and then we donate it to other people. This is Dave Halsell's site at Green Park Farm, which was our first site um, that we um, diversified eight years ago, and that is now becoming a donor site. This is a site at Halwell, which we seeded. Um, regrettably, it was a, it was something that had been sprayed off uh, with chemicals by the previous owner because they didn't think it would sell if it had a range of wildflowers in it. And six years later, after seeding and green haying and getting the management right, um, we've got something very diverse indeed. This is another site at Broom Hill started off full of creeping buttercups and a few years later is a much more diverse meadow and of course a much more diverse ecosystem. I mentioned we work with cows in clover and their small, uh, well not so small now, Dex, herd of Dexter cattle. Um, animals are fantastic, uh, grazing animals in our, in our system do a fantastic job. Um, it shouldn't be necessarily underrated from the way they um, graze from their dentition so sheep will nibble fantastic to have uh, winter grazing to take things down short to reduce grass competition cows are a heavier animal they browse and they rasp so they pull with their tongs creates a varied structure and their dung so important for dung beetles um, and of course the bat the young juvenile bats that will feed on them and so this is what uh habitat connectivity looks like this is a more formal version um these are the kind of maps that um me and my managers look at the yellow areas are where we've got new new head new uh, meadows um that links to um to county wildlife sites, existing sites, to nature reserves, um, South Efford Marsh, which is to the left of what's signed as Venn Meadows, and the new reserve Bridge End Med Meadows. The red areas are where we've connected with landowners. Um, we're creating new, uh, putting new corridors in, and this is how we build up um, our picture. So I just want to say uh, to encourage you to do what you can um, to thank you landowners who are listening in or will be listening into the recording. If you're taking action on your land, then keep going. Um, because on behalf of the harvest mouse, the heath lobelia, the grey long-eared bat, the mother Shipton moth and all our, all our relations, we really need you to do this work. We are making a difference. We are joining things up, creating new habitat networks. Let's keep going. 
act now do what you can whether you've got a garden whether you uh, have got a window box uh, whether you're a landowner if you feel you're doing all you can tell your neighbors spread the word uh, if you can support our work then do um, but your um, actions really do make a difference and and we need everybody to um, to help nature recover thank you for listening I'll just see if uh, my colleagues are aware that I finished and whether there are any questions. Sorry, Lynn, and I just realised that's I'm on right. Mute. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Uh, that was very tech savvy of me, wasn't it? Um, thank you. And um, could you unshare your screen just so we can see your face a little bit better and then we can go through some of the questions. OK, there I um, am. Just uh, in terms of the audience itself, if you do have any other questions, do pop them in the chat. Uh, I've just realised that my own screen isn't on, so I shall do that just so everyone can see me as well. Brilliant. Yeah, so just want to say really welcome your questions and your input and what we don't have time to deal with tonight, um, you'll certainly get, get, get a response at some stage. Yeah. Um, and if I can't answer, then um, we, know, um, we know people who can. Excellent. So, uh, one, the first question is, uh, it's very interesting and inspiring. How can we replicate this on a micro scale in a semi-urban small garden? Yellow rattle, possibly not an option here. And it's also fabulous to see the results from changes in management. Yes, well, I think you can, there's quite a lot you can do, even if yellow rattle is not an option. Um, so just think about, well, look at what you've got already and see if you've got any gaps. Um, aim to have something in flower all year round. So see where your gaps are. When is your earliest flowering shrub or plants um, or trees? And when's your latest flowering shrub? I, you know, can you encourage some ivy? Can you, can you have a water feature? If you haven't got one, um, then can you create one? It doesn't have to be a pond. It could just be um, a bog garden, a bucket with water in, anything like that, and let some grass grow up, encourage some bramble, have a nettle patch, have a compost heap, uh, wood piles, sh shavings, mulchings, um, anything that will attract wildlife in on an all year round basis. And actually, um where you um what you connect to so whether you uh, connect to other gardens whether you could work with your neighbors to um you know have a like a hedge a hedgehog run um that kind of thing fantastic very inspirational lynn and i would say that also we have quite a few resources on the website in terms of creating wildflower meadows and i know that there's certainly been achievement from our perspective. I mean, we've got um, a cricket pit mill a garden in our extra uh, office, and that has a mix of sort of calm grass and seed, and that has really come in leaps and bounds in the last few years. So I think you can have a small sort of patch um, of wildflowers and it can really thrive. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So someone has asked, can you visit Brimridge? <laughs> well, um... We're going to hold an open an open day at Brimridge um, in in mid June, so um, I would imagine that our members would be invited to that. It's not it's not open to the public, um, but we will be running some open days and walks. So watch this space. Yeah. So um, on that note, if you want to take a look at our events on our website, then um, you can obviously keep up to date with any events like what Lynn just mentioned. Um, someone's asked, can anyone do, uh, get a donation of wildflower seeds? If, if you're in the Avon Valley and um, you have a meadow to, that you want to enhance, 
then please approach me because we could uh, work with you and donate seed to get your meadow, um, help it regenerate or restore or create a new area. In terms of um, donations outside of the Aden Valley, I think that we're looking at um, perhaps being able to offer wildflower seed within Exeter, within our Exeter Wild City project? So um, I would say on that note that we, I would probably contact our wildlife help desk. It's hdesk at denwildlifetrust.org because we might put the feelers out to our different project staff and they may find that they've got a donor site that they might be able to provide seed with. If we don't have any of our own sites that provide wildflower seed, we can put you in touch with um, or, or, or companies or kind of businesses that we've used in the past that we can certainly refer you to and have a good mix of native wildflowers. So we, if you if you contact us directly, then we can try and put, put you in the right direction for sure. That's a really good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'm here to support you, Lynn. <laughs> uh, so someone's just said thank you for the advice um, about wildflowering and these sort of hedgehog corridors. Um, yeah, so I think... Oh, someone's just put, what's the best time of year for seeding wildflowers? Well, we seed in the, in the autumn um, when the grass growth is declining. You need to create some patches of bare ground, but it means that the seeds can get established before the, the grass has that, you know, the energy of the spring. If you're uh, seeding in the spring, then seed onto cultivated ground um, because if you're putting into existing your existing grass sward or lawn all the grass is going to be really vigorous at that time so i would i would work towards autumn sowing excellent and someone's just put a very helpful comment um i think it's barbara saying that um, more meadows uh, the sort of community group might be able to help with wildflower seed um kind of sources um so they're quite a useful group um, absolutely they're, they're good to search them yeah they are a really wonderful source of expertise and and help mm -hmm. so we can make that um website address available probably yes yes yeah. so i'm i i will make a note of that and i can make it available in an email after the talk um, yeah. Yes. Uh, someone's just put, um, if you have a land outside of the Avon Valley, does DWT offer advice RE wildfire meadow creation for five plus acres? Uh, yes, we do. Um, if, if that person would like to email me, then I can provide more information and support. Fantastic. I think I put your email in the sort of in the chat earlier on. Um, but if you don't have Lynn's email, feel free to send an email over to contact us and it can be passed on. Great. Um, excellent. Um, questions. Do you need to have some grass for the yellow rattle? No, you don't. But it will, <laughs> it will parasitize other things. So it's a semi parasite. So it takes half its food source from other plants mm -hmm. um, and it photosynthesizes as well. So um, you don't need. If you, if you haven't got, we, you, we, we're using yellow rattle as a tool. And yellow rattle, I think, historically was a, 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 a component part of traditional hay meadows. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily got to be a component part of a meadow. Great answer. Um, someone's asked, rough grassland, what species are there? Okay. Or were there, rather? So, so if you think of co coxfoot, is a tuck is a tussock is a naturally tussock forming grass. So as it grows up and it dies back, grows up, dies back, it forms these tussocks. So to get the tussocks, if you've got if you can put some coxfoot seed down, that's ideal. But I think any grassland that you just any grass species that you allow to to grow up, die back and then grow up again, it creates a kind of a thatch and a thicket. And it's that thatch and thicket that's really good for insects and also which, um, which small mammals can scurry under. 
And they're really beautiful as well in their own right grasses. The sea, goldfinches feed on the seeds. Um, their flower heads are quite beautiful. Fantastic. It was very inspiring. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and I guess the last question is, um, how can people get involved in the project if they're not a landowner? OK, um, there are. So if you're in South Brent or Lodiswell or Bigbury, those three centres have really good action groups. Um, so there's the South Brent Bugs and Bees Initiative, um, Wild About Lodiswell Community Action Group is just setting up, and Big Bree Net Zero, um, and other parishes along the way are also, um, they've really got hold of the fact that communities need to do something. So um, I'm aware that, that, that communities are coming together. So I'm sure that if, you've not, if you're not living already in one of those centres that I've mentioned, um, that your local parish will be organising something. Um, but again, people could email me and we do have our Wilder Communities team which is uh, set up to signpost people to groups where they can get in touch. And if anyone wants to volunteer with Devon Wildlife Trust to help on the practical side, then that's another way that people can help and get involved. Brilliant. Well, thank you for such a, for a wonderful talk, Lynn. It's been absolutely fantastic to hear about your work um, and kudos to you for sort of sticking to it. And I know you gave thanks to a lot of other people, but obviously take, take some of the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Thank you. I, I would like to say, uh, uh, I think my, uh, the owl barn owls are probably my favourite, but I'm, I'm being a little bit biased. Um, I'd just like to say that, um, well, besides thank you to Lynn, that we do have our next online talk coming up on sort of a s similar note. It's called, um, let me just get the title up. It's called, What If You Just Leave It? Rewilding Unwrapped with Dr. Sam Rose. And it's uh, due to be a very exciting talk. And that's on the 24th of March. And you can find that on our Eventbrite list and uh, shortly on our website as well. So if you're interested in finding more about things like rewilding, um, do come along to that talk. Um, thank you, everyone, for your fantastic questions. Um, you've been a brilliant audience and uh, wish you all well and a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.